the middle of the night, on the Atlantic Ocean, an eerie orange glow inflames the sky. A glow of heat, a glow of horror. It is November, 1965. Fire is destroying a cruise ship, the Yarmouth Castle. Their passengers face the agonizing choice of risking the flames or the sharks of the Atlantic. Yet no call for help has been sounded, and the captain has abandoned the ship. The tragedy of the Yarmouth Castle haunts her survivors and the families of those who died. And they wonder if the midnight flames were one of the ocean's worst accidents, or if, as some believe, it was murder. Modern cruise ship is a floating dream, serene and sumptuous, and subject to stringent regulations that make this most luxurious mode of travel also one of the safest. But there was a time when a voyage aboard these maritime palaces was far more perilous, a danger made horribly real in 1934 when the Morrow Castle is engulfed in flames off the coast of New Jersey. Here are the first pictures of a terrible tragedy of the sea, equaled only by those of the Titanic and Lusitania. That disaster causes the United States government to outlaw wooden decks and walls on all passenger ships that fly the American flag. But in the 1960s, international law requires no such safeguards, a risk of which passengers are never informed. Among this foreign fleet is the Yarmouth Castle. Christened the Evangeline, she is launched in 1927, her decks and cabins built of the finest hardwoods. By 1965, she has been rewired and repainted countless times. But every weekend, she sails from Miami to the Bahamas, her passengers unaware of the perils of her dry wooden decks. It is a voyage of affordable luxury, $59 round trip. But her sailing of November 12th, 1965, will be a one-way cruise to catastrophe. A rookie captain named Byron Futsinas will steer her out of Miami. A Greek citizen, he's been at the helm for only eight months. But his course tonight is familiar. The Bahama Star will also be cruising from Miami to Nassau under the command of another young captain, American Carl Brown. Captain Brown intends to follow a few miles behind the Yarmouth Castle on what should be a smooth, routine crossing. Brown served aboard the Yarmouth Castle before the ship's name was changed. It's an old seaman's tradition that if you change the name of a ship, you're going to change your luck. So here's the ship, the Evangeline, for 27 years. And then the Yarmouth Cruise Line buys it in 64 and changes the name. We all made comments about it because the ship was tied up in Miami uh, at the time. And the day we saw them chiseling the letters off the bow, Evangeline, somebody said, Boy, they're going to be in for trouble now. The Yarmouth Castle's name is new, and so is her crew. There are Americans, Europeans, Caribbean Islanders, sailors from a dozen nations. Among the newcomers, Canadian Terry Wise, hired one day earlier as third purser 
a sort of hotel desk clerk at sea. I, of course, met every passenger as they boarded the ship. You welcome them aboard, take their boarding pass, check their ticket. But on the Bahama Stars, it turns out, and said I was looking for a job as a purser, and they said, try the Armal Castle, the ship right behind us. I know that somebody's just gone off sick. So I went down and uh, spoke to the chief purser, George Vietes, and uh, I told him I'd had a lot of practical experience on ships. I'd basically just stowed away back from London to Montreal on the Empress of Canada. I didn't tell him I stowed away. He said, what was your last ship? And I said, the Empress of Canada. And so he said, fine, you're hired. And uh, that was great. So we sailed that night into Miami. I got my uniform the next day, and uh, it was the next day it all happened. Kay and Marlene Thompson, the daughters of a senior Bahamian official, are returning home. Because we were sort of uh, frequenting and that sort of thing, and we did sail a lot. Um, we got to know Captain Carl Brown on the Bahama Star and Captain Byron Boutsinas on the uh, Yarmouth Castle. Carl Brown uh, was a good friend of ours, and we dated for a while. The Yarmouth Castle is ready to sail. 379 passengers and a crew of 176. The day we were leaving on the Yarmouth Castle, Captain Vutsinas came to the uh, rail where we were waving bye to Mummy, and um, he told her not to worry, I'll take care of your girls, they'll be fine. All are about to share a nightmare that will haunt them forever, 87 will never see land again. At 5.45, the Bahama Star weighs anchor. A cargo ship, the Finpulp, joins the two cruise liners. Later, it will take the lead on a calm, clear evening on a midnight cruise to paradise. Aboard the Yarmouth Castle, passengers settle in. The Goldmans of Miami won their tickets in a raffle. They bring along their two oldest boys. I was excited that I was going on this trip. I have five children, and I hadn't been anywhere for a long time. So this was exciting to me, and just being able to go away, I commented the rooms were a little small, and uh, with four of us, it was a little crowded, but uh, I said it's just for sleeping anyway. In fact, we could hear the rudder when the ship moved. The rudder would creak. We were right near the rudder. But um, since we had a, uh, a donated cabin, we couldn't really complain. But there are a few less contented passengers demanding attention from purser Terry Wise. When I got to the steamship company, I had the wrong tickets. The cabin I was supposed to get was not available, and they wanted to put me down below. I refused to get on the ship unless they would give me an outside cabin. Which today I realized saved my life. By 7 p.m., the Yarmouth Castle is cruising at a pace that will put her in Nassau by morning. We went to dinner. I think we had the first sitting, and it was uh, something like turkey and dressing, and the boys were happy, they were eating. Captain Lutzinas sent uh, wine to the table for us, and then after dinner, we decided we'd go and um, see him and tell him thank you for the wine. As midnight approaches, an unoccupied cabin will become the focus of a mystery. No one will ever know what really happened in room 610. The Goldmans take a quiet stroll on the boat deck. I was the one at the beginning. I said, look at these lifeboats. They're painted so many times, I said, you can't even see the bolts. You remember that, honey? Yes. And I said, boy, boy, I hope these never have to go off.
I was dating Captain Brown at the moment. And um, when we left Captain Vutsinas, I said, well, I'll go call Captain Brown. And he was, you know, he was shocked. He said, well, where are you and what are you doing? Where are you? And I said, I'm in front of you on the uh, Yarmouth Castle. And he says, you didn't come on my ship. I'll get you when you get back. So uh, then we had a few more words and then I hung up and he said, I said, see you in Nassau. And a little did I know we'd be seeing Captain Brown very, very soon. Joyce Palouche is settling into her cabin. Captain Vutsinas has turned in. The Yarmouth Castle is now under the command of the second mate. It should be an easy watch. But nothing about this night will be routine. At 12.30, a watchman begins his patrol. He's assigned to inspect the vessel from top deck to bottom. But he carelessly fails to check one crucial corridor. Five minutes later, the first hint of trouble. Smoke is pouring from the ventilation system in the engine room. Crewmen summon the chief engineer, George Vazios. But Vazios does not think the problem is serious, and no one notifies the sleeping captain. The smoke could be coming from almost anywhere. The Yarmouth Castle's ventilation system is a labyrinth of antique pipes and ducts. The watchman continues his rounds, but he never enters the hallway where the fire is smoldering. At 12.50 a.m., the inspection tour is over. The Yarmouth Castle has been on fire for three quarters of an hour, and no one on the bridge has been informed. Only a few crewmen and the chief engineer know of the danger threatening the passengers and crew on this midnight cruise. Then, without warning, a man badly burned stumbles from a bathroom under the promenade deck into the arms of the night janitor. Still, George Vazios does not sound the alarm. He's certain that the fire is only a minor problem. It is a tragic mistake. Finally, at 1.10 a.m., as the engine room begins to fill with smoke, Captain Vutsinas is awakened with the dreadful news. There is a fire on his ship, but no one can find its source. Captain Vutinas orders the general alarm, but few will hear it. This is a time for leadership and action. But aboard the Yarmouth Castle, 
there will be a tragic lack of both. As smoke begins to spread throughout the Yarmouth Castle, Captain Byron Vutsinas joins the chief engineer in a frantic search. In room 610, a storage closet, they find the origin of the flames. Crewmen attempt to extinguish the blaze, but they are much too late. For more than an hour, the fire has been gaining strength. A wooden stairway has become a natural chimney, drawing the flames up through the wooden decks towards the bridge and the radio room. The radio operator attempts to reach his station, but the room is ablaze. The Yarmouth Castle cannot send an SOS. And before Captain Vutsinas can issue an announcement to abandon ship, the bridge is engulfed in flames. The Yarmouth Castle and her hundreds of helpless passengers are on their own. I guess it must have been around midnight or thereabouts. I heard all this noise and I woke up and this friend of mine was awake and she said, boy, that captain must be having some party. You can hear them breaking glass. And I heard about 1 a.m., I, I think, uh, some noises and everyone's partying. And they were making more noise and I got annoyed because I said, they're gonna wake the kids. We had a lot of giggling outside the room, so I opened the door and there were these two boys. One was a young teenager and the other about 10 or 12. And I asked them, what on earth were they doing at that hour of the morning? Why were they making so much noise? And so the older guy said, well, the ship's on fire and we don't have any life jackets. And I said, well, that's a very silly joke to be pulling at this hour. I said, you just don't do things like that. So he says, we're not joking. But I could hear all this running and everybody kind of milling around outside or, or clearing out. So I hopped out of bed and I got dressed and opened my cabin door and just, all it was was just thick, black, oily smoke just poured in. I remember my heart kind of skipping a little bit then I just had to get things out of here. And I said, wait a minute. I said, there's something wrong. And when I opened the cabin door, there was water, burnt pieces of lumber and smoke. So I slammed the door shut and I realized that the ship was on fire. Then someone knocked on our door, and we opened the door, and a porter ran in. He ran to our closet, he opened the closet, and took the life preservers and ran out. When he took the life jackets, I knew there, there was trouble, and uh, actually I was ready to run out with the children, just in our uh, nightwear. And Everyone. I said, no, hold up. Ships like this take a long time to, to sink and to burn. Let's get everybody dressed. And my friend, in the meantime, had been over by the, the porthole windows and could not do anything at all with them. They were just, she couldn't open them. And uh, I went over, and I guess with the help of God, they opened. And I stuck my head out, and I looked to the left, and the whole ship was just burning from the water line up. I looked above me, and there was nothing above me. And the first thing I noticed was a gentleman that his skin was completely burnt. I didn't want the children to see it. It, it was so horrible. I had never seen anything like that. I couldn't see anything. I just thought, like, where am I going? Just in a mental map. Just opened my door and then just, and I fell down a couple of times. The smoke was just horrid. And anyway, I just kept my hand on the, the bulk of the wall and just kept going until I hit the stairwell, knowing that I, I knew where I was then just by, by the field. And finally emerged up onto the uh, upper decks. I ran into cabins on my way up. 
and try to scrounge life jackets. And I did, we did find, I found three of them, actually, and I put them on Betty and her two kids. So they had life jackets. As we were going up from the lower deck to the upper deck, it was a lot of smoke around. I was choking. I just couldn't uh, catch my breath. And I thought, that I'm a goner. There was a lady in the cabin next to me, and she had her life jacket on. And we were talking back and forth through the porthole windows. And the next thing I knew, there was a black gentleman who was leaning over and they made a human ladder out of him. And he said, he said, I'll pull you out. And he did. And then he pulled my friend down and the lady next to us, she wouldn't take off her jacket and they never got her out she was more afraid of the water than the fire and they never i never saw her again it was just really pandemonium and some were panicking everybody not knowing what to do there was certainly no direction, no orders being given by any anyone. And uh, it was just a very scary, scary time for passengers. Eight miles ahead, the radar operator aboard the cargo ship Finpulp notices that the Yarmouth Castle has stopped moving. The Finpulp reverses course, but it will take her 45 precious minutes to reach the stricken liner. Aboard the Yarmouth Castle, Captain Vutsinas has one hope left. A radio stowed in lifeboat number three. But it too is on fire. The heat so intense, the captain is overcome by the flames and the understanding that his ship is doomed. Some members of his crew said that at that point, he seemed to have a nervous collapse. So maybe that's why. In the midst of the confusion, Vutsinas collects a few of his officers and climbs into one of the first lifeboats to be lowered from the burning deck. After firing a few flares, they row toward the approaching fin pump. I don't know what he did. I know what he didn't do, but I don't, I don't know why. If someone goes into a state of shock, how can they be the leader that's expected? And how could anybody know that that was the way he would react? The Armoured Castle is now a ship without a captain. Her long night of terror has just begun. Two a.m. The luxury cruise ship has become a floating inferno. Five hundred and fifty passengers and crew are trapped in a desperate struggle for their lives. But our captain, God bless him, he was the first to leave the ship. And when I was on the deck, there he was. He and other crew members were in the lifeboat. And I have no idea where they thought they were going. But I know they were leaving that ship. I think it was a young British officer who pointed out. He said, there's the, there's the captain. I mean, can you believe it? There's a captain out in that boat there. And I said, like, I can't believe it. But there he was. And it was with other officers. But it really didn't have any time to think. Everything was happening so quickly. Fire consumes the wooden walls and decks of the 40-year-old liner. Then rages furiously towards the stern, 
where hundreds of passengers are huddled. Twelve miles away, the Bahama Star spots a strange glow on the horizon. Captain Carl Brown is called to the bridge. I saw a red smudge on the horizon. It didn't really look like a fire, I, I, but it drew my attention, so I, I had a look at it. Color started to smudge in such a way that I, I could tell it was a fire, and I, we were heading for it anyway. We changed course a little, and we increased speed. In his lifeboat, Captain Byron Vucinas of the Yarmouth Castle approaches the cargo ship Finpop, which has already sent a call for help to the United States Coast Guard. The officers of the Finpop refuse to let Vucinas and his crew on board. Captain Vucinas will always claim that he never meant to abandon his command, only to summon help and then return to aid in the rescue. I just couldn't believe it. That there was certainly no direction, and no officers shouting orders, and no crew assisting. It was just a great free-for-all. Everybody uh, for themselves, basically. The ship was just like a tinderbox. Many, many layers of paint, and they were just basically exploding. The sprinkler systems on board didn't seem to work that night. Fire hoses seemed to have no pressure, just a, just a trickle. And uh, I believe that some of the davits and the lifeboats were basically painted stuck. The mood of the, the people on the deck was definitely terror because uh, it was so disorganized. Everything was disorganized. We never had a fire drill. We never had a warning that there was a fire. We never had a fire alarm. There was nothing. But some crewmen stay at their posts and become heroes. Uh, I mean, people are still screaming all the time and, and stumbling around trying to find each other. I was at the same time trying to get people over the side. But other people, uh, they had to be forcibly pushed off the ship. I mean, I'd just pick them up and throw them over the side like you're going. And, uh, or uh, here, I'll help you up and then goodbye. It's a long drop. At that time, the fire was getting too thick and too heavy, and we couldn't, um, there was nowhere to go, and it was way down. Then someone else started screaming, don't get into the water, it's shark infested. And Marlene looked at me and I at, at her and I said, well, I just hope mommy and daddy know that we died before the sharks got us. And then all of a sudden, as though out of nowhere, this very tall man appeared. And he was very, very calm and he said, uh, there's a little ladder here which we had not seen before. And we looked immediately as he helped me over and the man had disappeared. He had gotten us to this sort of clearing, clearing on the deck. Area. It was clear we could breathe, and we could see the, the, the uh, bow of the ship up in flames, I mean, literally, and kind of coming towards us. And he said, you'll be all right here for a while. Stay here as long as you can, but you can get over the side. There's the ladder. Wait there, the lifeboats will come. We kind of think that he was our guardian angel, because literally after that, everything, we started to, to get to safety. Up on the upper decks, we went to see if we could get into the lifeboat. And there were uh, two or three crewmen trying to launch the lifeboat. And I guess Betty and I and the kids got into the lifeboat. And while we were in the lifeboat, the lifeboat turned on its side. And uh, I lost my grip on Randy, and then I reached down. He had fallen, but fallen to the side of the lifeboat. I remember reaching out and, and bringing the kids back onto the ship from this lifeboat because it was in serious danger of, of slipping or falling or going askew. I remember helping Mr. Goldman and handing him back the kids. And just before he left, I gave him my life jacket. I said, go with your, go with your wife and kids. Come on, get out of here. Go with them. And because he had been helping me throw things off. And I said, no, just get off with them. I'll be fine. Approaching the Yarmouth Castle, Captain Carl Brown of the Bahama Star can see lifeboats in the water and panic on the decks. We got our full crew on the job and have swung out all our boats, 14. So that by the time we arrived, 
we were ready to lower the boats. Aboard the Bahama Star, a passenger records horrifying images of fire at sea. At 2.25 a.m., the Bahama Star pulls alongside. And it was a real calamity. There were people gathered on the stern, which was the best place to be because the fire was forward. Um, the hottest part of the fire was right forward of the smokestack. And the bridge was in that area, and the radio room was in that area. And they were made of teak wood, so they were burning um, fiercely when we got there. And soon after we arrived, the bridge collapsed. And there were passengers on the bow of the Yarmouth Castle, and, and they were safe there. It's just they couldn't go aft because the, this vicious fire was blocking their way, so they had to go one end of the ship or the other. This is your captain speaking. I'll never forget that. He's like a, a knight on a, a big white charger. That's the, you know, what came into my mind. The, the white uh, Bahama Star with all of her floodlights on. It was a big white ship. And he had all his lifeboats all down just above the water. And uh, Captain Brown got on a bullhorn. And he said, I'm going to send the lifeboats over. Look before you jump. Don't jump into a lifeboat or don't jump on anybody's head. And so most of them looked, but a few didn't. And one of the man most seriously injured that we got on our ship had broken both legs and pelvic bones and so on because he jumped and landed in a boat. I think he later died. Get him on the lifeboat! We started to climb down those ladders. And we got down to the bottom, which was the water line, uh, I guess is around the, the side of the ship. And I held on to that and also to the rope. And there were maybe four or five of us on that front ladder. And the lifeboats just kept coming in and out. And finally one came to the front and picked us up. And when it did, the debris from above fell right after we launched off from there. We went to the very stern, the very rear of the ship, and I called a, uh, a lifeboat. I called to the people on the lifeboat, and they came to the stern, and I passed them a rope. Then I slid Mitchell down the rope, and Mitchell did a good job. And Randy nearly lost his footing, but he got down the rope, and then we slid Betty down the rope. And the children kept saying, look, Mommy, look at the fire. Look on the boat. And I just kept looking back toward the Bahama Star to make sure that we were going to be saved. But it was very hot. I thought, is she going to blow up? Of course, at that stage, everything goes through your head. Finally, a lifeboat came by. And as it came towards the ship, it was rocking. And the people were so unsteady in it, and they were moving around. And it came up against the Yarmouth Castle and had hit the ship and had cut off someone's fingers. As we were rowing from, from the Yarmouth Castle to the Barnard Star, I could look up and I could see through the portholes, there were people running back and forth, but there were fire at the forward passageway and the uh, center passageway, and those people were trapped. And we could see the shadows running back and forth. And it was a terrible thing. For passengers in cabins directly above the fire, there is no hope of escape from the suffocating smoke and the killing flames. In 1965, the firefighters probably did not stand a chance in breaking out equipment and getting hoses on the scene and fighting the fire at that point. The fire would need to be detected in minutes. If not, the fire growth would cause a substantial increase in the hazard to the passengers and to the vessel itself. It would appear that the people who were trapped and died in that fire probably would have died even if an SOS had been sent out by the ship. Uh, most of the people who were killed in the fire were uh, living in staterooms uh, around the forward staircase. And the fire had started at the base of the forward staircase and got behind the wood paneling and got in the ventilation system for the 
galley or kitchen. That grease was burning, burning like a blowtorch. And then we were taken onto the Bahamas store. And as soon as we got on the ship, they gave us uh, they gave us a, a, a shot of whiskey, a pack of cigarettes, and a blanket. I remember those three things so distinctly. And I had sandwiches and, and liquor and things like that spread out. We weren't particularly hungry, but they had they had refreshments spread out for the people for the survivors. When I finally did go off, there was nobody else on the ship that I could see. No, no passengers. Nobody left, really. And Captain Brown was making, from the, from the bridge of his ship, was indicating, like, get off. Jump into the water and get off now. Get off. So I kind of thought, well, I guess it's, now is the time. But uh, as it turned out, I went off a rope, and I landed right in one of his lifeboats. I didn't even get my feet wet. By 4 a.m., the last survivors have left the Yarmouth Castle. I had hoped that everybody made it on deck. I didn't know that there hadn't been an organized evacuation. I didn't uh, know that there were people already dead, burned to death in their cabins that never got out of their cabins. So we picked up everybody we could find, and that turned out to be about uh, 374. I was talking to some of the people, and one gentleman in particular, uh, his wife had taken some sleeping pills, and um, he just could not move her. He ran out, hoping that it wouldn't be anything serious and that she would be okay, but she did die in the cabin. And it was very sad, I think, a lot of the stories. And the passengers and the crew of the Bahamas Star could not have been nicer. I had a passenger offer me their cabin, and I went down, and <clears throat> I think I was in there for about 30 seconds and had to run out and get back on deck again. I could not be inside that cabin. Well, I, I was on the bridge, and Captain Vucinas came to the bridge just shortly before his ship sank. And he said, I want to go back to the ship. And he was covered with soot and, and all. I said, your ship is going to sink. And then someone distracted me in some way, and I looked away. And when I looked back again, he was gone. I don't know why he wanted to go back, because the ship was completely on fire from bow to stern. He wouldn't have been able to do anything. Maybe he wanted me to know that he wanted to go back. Don't know what happened after that. When the ship was fully on fire, it must have been the, uh, the heat was drawing the wind, and the ship began to make a terrible moaning sound. It sounded like a it sounded like a baby doll crying, except that it went on and on. And at exactly 6 a.m., the arm of the castle was completely burned. It just rolled over and sank. And the ocean was completely clear. It was just like a human. And she she would go like this. And you could see her going down, sinking. But it seemed like an old man that was on his last breath. It was very, very graceful and very, very quiet, very peaceful. Like at last she'd found peace, you know? And there were only three things. There were three empty lifeboats. And that was, it was very, very moving, actually. She will come to rest 1,800 feet below the warm Atlantic waves, holding forever the bodies of 87 people. 
leaving the mystery of whether her loss was an accident or arson. At first light, the most badly burned casualties of the Yarmouth Castle are evacuated by Coast Guard helicopters. The Bahama Star carries other survivors to Nassau and the end of their ordeal. Nearly 90 people have gone down with the ship. Three more will die of their burns. The Yarmouth Castle is the worst American shipping disaster since the 1930s. We were actually shocked when we, uh, then we got the casualty figures. Right, and I never dreamed that anybody did not get out. And one question torments the survivors and the families of the victims. How could a fire in a storage closet cause such destruction and loss of life? Where's the cause of the fire? Here? We don't know, and uh, you'll have to ask them. They know. I understand they know exactly where it started, and they know where the, um, uh, who, well, they know who uh, reported the fire the first time. In Nassau, as the Thompson sisters are reunited with their parents, a rumor has already spread the fire was not an accident. We think perhaps it could have been prevented, the fire could have been prevented, had the crew known in time. But um, on the other hand, we also think if it was uh, arson, it was done properly so that no one would know. There was a lot of speculation in uh, NASA chatting to then other crew members that I was meeting there. And, and, and everybody seemed to uh, have different ideas and stories, but the one rumor that kind of kept cropping up was that it was probably set, that uh, it almost had to be where it was located and how fast it went. Within a week, the Coast Guard convenes an official inquiry in Miami. Experts testify that aging ships like the Yarmouth Castle were floating disasters waiting for a single spark. We have for years been pointing out that these vessels are unsafe, one of the things about this vessel that the passengers couldn't possibly have known about, but which we have complained about, is that they are not required to meet the safety requirements that American vessels are. Protected from American safety regulations by their Panamanian flag, the Yarmouth Castle was a legal fire trap. But how did the fire start? Captain William Kessler was a member of the inquiry. The theories about how it started was that this room, 610, where the uh, fire started, had been used as a storage area and had mattresses in it, but it had also a naked bulb, light bulb, and naked wires leading to that light bulb. Now, that was the one theory that the mattresses came in contact with the light bulb, but how actually it started we were never able to pin that down. The real problem was in the watchman not uh, finding the fire and smoke on his rounds. And apparently there was fire and smoke at this time. The Coast Guard is critical of many of the crew's actions. The failure to detect the fire earlier. The failure to sound a general alarm. And individual acts of negligence and cowardice. But what draws the harshest judgment is the captain's desertion at the moment of greatest danger. Is it possible that the fire was discovered earlier and it was decided not to give the general alarm so as not to frighten the passengers? No, absolutely no, because when they called me, when I, while I was sleeping, I didn't know what kind of fire it was, or I don't know anything. Since I don't know the science of fire, I ordered the, uh, the alarm signal. Who was in command while you were rowing on the boat, sir? Where? On the uh, Yarmouth. On the Yarmouth? Who was in command when you were in that? Uh, there were the rest of the officers, each one on his station, so commanding each one his own station. There was no way to give any more orders. The orders have, have been given already. The uh, Board of Investigation found that his actions in leaving the vessel were negligent 
He did not exercise the command responsibility that was expected of a captain of a vessel, and his whole actions during that period were not that, what would be expected of a passenger vessel master. As a foreign national, Vucinas cannot be charged with negligence by American authorities. But his career as a passenger ship commander is over. And to this day, he refuses to talk publicly about the disaster. In the 1990s, fire science achieves new expertise, leading to a more accurate analysis of the destruction of the Yarmouth Castle. What probably killed the people in their cabins on the Yarmouth Castle was that the smoke had trapped them and could have even come into the rooms before they even got out of bed. As the fire grows in the, the compartment of origin, it reaches a point where the entire room becomes involved, and that's called the point of flashover. It is very difficult to fight the fire at this time because of the large amount of heat that's being generated and the large amount of smoke that's leaving the compartment. But how did the deadly blaze start? Captain Vucina suspects arson, and he is not alone. So I've always maintained that there probably was a good chance that it was, uh, that it was deliberate. And it was something that got totally out of control. I don't think it was meant to have that sort of an impact that deaths occur. If the fire was a deliberate criminal act, causing the deaths of 90 souls, it is unlikely that the arsonist will ever be brought to justice. Whatever its cause, the catastrophe forces a rewriting of the rules that govern the cruise ship industry. In 1974, as a result of the Yarmouth Castle disaster, the international regulations were changed which prohibited the use of wood in the walls and the decks of the vessel. Also, the regulations required that the route to the lifeboats be enclosed and protected from fire. You'll see a little fire break out in the engine room, or a little fire break out in the storeroom, that you won't see a ship swept by fire the way the Yarmouth Castle was. The Regulations today more proactively address prevention as opposed to rescue after the fact. Today, cruise ships are built of fire-resistant materials, rigorously tested in modern laboratories. And at the Coast Guard facility at Mobile, Alabama, ships are set on fire to test new construction techniques and extinguishing agents. Fires to prevent fires. This is one of the strategic accident sinkings, uh, tragedies that uh, resulted in, uh, in kicking off this uh, SOLAS, SOLAS, or Safety of Life at Sea. Uh, no matter what flag, they have to meet very stringent U.S. Coast Guard criteria. So no, I really don't think that uh, this is going to happen, certainly in North America again. the heroes of that awful night have not been forgotten. Captain Carl Brown receives a commendation for his role in the rescue of hundreds of survivors. And in 1995, the Coast Guard honors the heroism of Purser Terry Wise, who by then has spent his life as a professional sailor. Even now, many of the survivors of the Yarmouth Castle find it impossible to forget that night of horror. I see some faces of some people. I see that lady's face in the cabin next to me sometimes. And she shouldn't have, she shouldn't have perished. 
These people should, nobody should have died on that ship. Nobody. A waste of life. I did not want to look at a boat. I didn't want to go near the water. It was a good 15 years, I would say, before I took, not a cruise, but I went on, started to go on smaller boats. I would get up in the night and I'd go to break my bedroom windows because I was trying to let people out. And mummy, bless her soul, she'd always be checking us every 15, 20 minutes. She couldn't sleep for the first few weeks that we were back. She had to keep looking at us to make sure we were there, we were all right, we were still okay. I can just see the ship on fire and I can still basically smell that acrid smoke. And uh, I can put myself right back against, the, 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 right on the boat deck by that rail so easily and uh, still see it very clearly. The era of ships like the Yarmouth Castle is finally over. A deadly season of water, flame, and fear.